Hi, so today we've got some uh, very unusual oddball equipment I picked up on eBay from someone that didn't really know what they had. This is an underwater radio modem. Um, this is the actual modem unit itself. There's this unit here which weighs a ton which I'm pretty sure is just a battery and this is the antenna um, which is like going to be um, some sort of wire loop. It's got some uh, sort of bits at the side here. I think we might have, this is all potted so I think we might have to um, use some extreme disassembly on this one. Um, I don't really know what sort of applications this is used for. It's probably you know offshore communicating with buried equipment, submersibles, that sort of thing. And being underwater, it's going to be sort of primarily using magnetic field comms, hence the large, large antenna. But um, let's take a look and see what we can figure out. So let's just get this one out of the way. I'm pretty certain this is a battery. This is really heavy. It weighs about 20 kilos. And someone's actually done a crude sort of carrying handle by sort of cable tying some um, strapping, because otherwise it's really um, awkward to lift and move around. Just a two pin connector on it. I suspect this is going to be a big bunch of uh, probably alkaline cells. So it's just this massive um, pack in here with uh, just cardboard holding it in place. A bit dodgy but I imagine these things are made in very small quantities so uh, perhaps that was just the easiest thing. It wasn't worth making a special foam insert or anything. The leads have actually been taped using uh, gaffer tape so presumably this has been replaced at some point but I don't know why they wouldn't use connectors here. Unless perhaps they, um, they had connectors to their own you know, special battery pack and they've just used an alternate source that didn't have the right connector so they just chopped the connector and sort of soldered it directly on. Yeah they have actually soldered this, maybe they did that rather than, rather than using a connector just because uh, the connector is one more thing to go wrong. So uh, but, uh, gaffer tape rather than heat shrink is a bit of a bodge. That's uh, duct tape for the American viewers by the way. And this is the pack inside. It's rated 28.5 volts, 80 amp hours. It says type alk, presumably alkaline. Let's see if we've actually got anything uh, left in here. Yeah, it measures 21 volts. Date here is July 2009. And it's just heat shrunk with some thin plastic. And as expected, we've just got a a big bunch of alkaline D cells. Which have been connected together using the normal spot weld uh, tab type constructions, also hot glue and these outer bits are just bits of quadrant wood on the outside with lots of hot glue. So uh, again it's a bit of a hand built type of uh, vibe here. Again, low volume. I'm sure they charge lots of money for these. Anything offshore and going to sea is going to be expensive. It needs to be done in sort of one, two, three, five sort of sets of batteries in parallel. So each layer is the 28.5 volts and each layer has got a diode in series. So that's presumably so that any failed cells don't drain down the rest of the pack and also to prevent um, charging. So each layer has got its own 5401 type um, diode in there. Okay let's look at this antenna now. Um, these connectors are interesting. I've never seen connectors like this before. There's a, the only name is SCS stamped in the, um, the rubber there and they're like completely molded on. It's like sort of one solid piece of well, rubber or rubber like material here and also on this this side there's sort of big sort of chunky piece of rubber so these are basically a fairly tight push fit so you've got like quite a long seal yeah basically the whole length of this pin is the seal so these sort of push down in here I guess it wouldn't be surprised me if they used a bit of silicon grease or something to make this going a bit easier and then um, there's these sort of two locking rings that basically clamp them together. But obviously these are clearly designed for underwater applications. They're probably designed such that the, um, the water pressure actually pushes the seal together to help the seal properly. So these just screw together and clamp it like that. But um, so I've never seen anything like that before. I'm sure this is probably maybe it's a standard in this particular industry. Now measuring across these pins, I'm measuring three independent sections, each with an inductance of about 90, um, 95 millihenries. Uh, it's got a handwritten serial number, 103-0209 date, so, and uh, it's Ken, who tested it. So I think 
around this square we've probably got one coil I'm not quite sure what's going on here though I would imagine that it's probably got coils in multiple orientations because the magnetic field communications are quite direction sensitive so I'm wondering if maybe sort of part of this coil goes sort of across and then up these diagonals um, but say so this is all glued and potted so I think I might just just do a cross section to see if I can figure out what's going on so I've just chopped a section through here and you can see there's sort of a bundle of wire here which I think is probably the which I think is probably the winding around the whole square the, these side sections they are slightly attracted to a magnet so I think there might be some ferrite core in there as well and I've just taken a slice off the end here and so there's just a piece of ferrite at the end and a little sort of v-cut here you can see some winding so I think these so I think these side pieces are probably based like ferrite rods at an angle to the main one to produce some pick up um, in other orientations to the main loop but this is it's a fairly sort of I'm not sure if this is nylon or PTFE it just sort of feels quite smooth plastic it's quite hard work to cut so I'm not going to um, do any more cutting on this I don't think I don't think it's really worth uh, worth it it looks like this has been modified at some point uh, it looks like this originally went here and they've, they've sawn off these sections presumably to make it fit over something so to the actual um, modem unit it's three connectors on here the power antenna and obviously this is the communications to whatever this is uh, communicating with uh, it's made by a company called Wy but Wireless Fibre Systems, who I think are defunct or they've been taken over. They don't seem to be exi to exist anymore. And this is constructed as a piece of piping with an end plug bolted onto each end. I'm sure there'll be some... Uh... Yeah, there's a couple of our ring seals on this, so that provides the ceiling. And inside here you can see some um, shielding I think it's just a uh, galvanized steel yeah steel and nothing else in the bottom so inside we've got this chassis with a few boards fixed to it there's a uh, sort of main board here with some sort of fairly high density devices board on the top which looks like it's power supply and power stuff so a few connections onto that um, RS232 port on a D9 connector there some connectors that have been ribbon cabled out to the side imagine those are perhaps JTAG or debug ports that have just been made a bit more accessible and on the back there's a section under a can so there's low noise 100 millihenry so that's, I'm guessing that'll be the analog stuff so this is the analog receive board it says modular RX issue 2 October 2008 so there's a couple of inductors here there's 12 millihenry and 33 millihenry surprisingly these are just sort of flapping around there's no um, not even any glue holding them down there's no foam or anything in here so um, yeah given a shock this there's some vibration these may be at risk of um, coming apart there's obviously PCB footprints for larger sort of drum core type inductors as well um, there's also a bunch of capacitors which I'm sure will be for tuning to a specific frequency and there's a couple of some relays here so I imagine that's to switch between different um, frequencies for different applications there's a variable gain, ampli variable gain amplifier here, a couple of op amps a few bod bodge wires um, DC's DC converter here, nothing else particularly um, exciting and I just put little DC impulse across these literally by just putting a little coin cell across them and you can see um, you get this resonance of the tuned circuit so this one of these is um, 2.8 kilohertz and the other one looks like about 3.7 although there is a, something probably some tipping of its conductors clamping that maybe due to the um, relay position so it's in the sort of low kilohertz region which is sort of what you'd expect for magnetic communications I think so on the other side we've got these two boards also on this end um, there's a board with a couple of relays on it and down here there's a board that's got DC's DC converter and if you look at the connections these are the connections from the antenna socket and two of the connections go down to this board and there's some MOSFETs so I'm sure that's going to be for the transmitter and then there's another six that go down to this board 
into two relays and, sh and then a shielded cable that then goes into this receiver board so it looks like it's got separate transmit and receive antenna coils which uh, makes a certain amount of sense let's take a look at these uh, boards to see uh, so there's quite a lot of unconnected pins this is the um, the interface to whatever this thing is talking to there's quite a lot of unconnected pins here there's one two three four five, five pins that are actually used so it's probably going to be an rs485 or rs232 interface i guess and it looks like that is rs232 because it goes into this um idc connector that's actually marked rs232 port one so let's have a poke around and see if we can see any data or anything on it right no sign of any data on either of those serial ports um i'm powering it up and it's taking about 150 milliamps but it could well be there's some additional sort of power up and reset controls on that data port that perhaps take it out of sleep mode so um maybe at least if we take the boards apart we might be able to find some other potential uh interesting things to poke around with right i just pulled all the boards off the chassis but left them connected together um, this top board is very clearly something that's come from a different product and just been used for this because for example there's a parallel bus UART chip here 16C550 that just goes to these um, bus connectors they just don't connect to anything so that that device just there's no way that can actually be doing anything at all and there's not many connections onto this so I think this is being used for the um, output driver section so there's, there's um, four MOSFETs here so that's probably going to be an H-bridge driving the um, the transmit coil there's a little bit of um, analog stuff there's some HCMOS here and some power stuff but that's really it so they're clearly just using the power driver from whatever this board was um, designed for yeah this is marked FETTX so it's transmitter um, 9th of April 2009 so you've got the designer's name S. Larson hello S. Larson if you're watching but um, yeah, so this is very clearly, you know, sort of we need a transmit board. We've got this in another product. So let's just use this rather than designing something um, custom. So this is the main um, logic board. We've got a um, TI TMS320 series DSP. That's clearly handling, going to be handling all the actual analog processing. There's also an Atmega 2560 here, which is probably doing all the um, just general management. Um, there's a couple of... 25C, um, 1025 E squared proms down there, some RAM, some flash for the DSP, Altera Max CPLD, uh, UART chip here. Uh, there's quite a few sort of various things like opto isolators for very interfacing. For example, here there's um, uh, labels marked sensor C, sensor B. So these are for external interfaces in other, other types of product. Just the usual power type stuff here not really a great deal so i've powered this up and i've not managed to get any any sort of serial out of anywhere obvious which is a bit annoying but other than that i don't think there's really a great deal we can uh, we can tell from this i read out the uh, code from the avr there's about 32k of code in there but this is the only text i could find in there so not particularly interesting so i haven't only really like getting any sort of sensible data or anything off of this thing i tried pulling the um e squareds off and there's nothing in those and i've tried sort of throwing various serial commands at it of course it could just be this unit's faulty which is why it ends up on ebay who knows but uh, if anyone knows anything more about these or how that what they're used for please um leave it in the comments I'd be quite interested to know and say the bit of a surprise in that particularly these um inductors sort of flapping around would have thought they'd have at least been um glued down and say this board just only sort of fairly small part of it being used so the, maybe this company had a, a number of different product ranges and uh, just picked this as a ready-made receiver board to avoid having to re-engineer re -engineer it but uh, this is the uh, these are the boards at the end there's a relay switcher to um, switch between the different receive coils and this is just a dc dc converter to provide um, power in S. Larson, that one, but um, yeah, it was a bit of a mystery when I bought it on eBay. I didn't really know what, yeah, what, what was going to be in it, so maybe uh, slightly disappointing, but hey, it's always uh, good to uh, pull mystery stuff apart, especially really obscure stuff from a, a very obscure industry.